Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I'm happy to see you all here on this uh, snow-covered day. It, it looks really pretty, um, especially with the window in front of it. Um, now, actually, I was driving the other day to get some stuff, and I just started getting a craving for frosted mini-wheats. Um, but anyway... Um, today is the first Sunday in February, so we have communion today. Um, if you uh, didn't bring your own Jesus, we do have some prepackaged Jesus back uh, in the narthex. Um, and I th think that's the only th thing I have to announce. Oh, um, there'll be an email going out tomorrow about um, a Lenten devotional and Bible study time. Uh, that I'm going to be doing that will uh, go in concert with um, our Lent theme uh, and sermon series. So there'll be some more information about that, and we'll also print it uh, for the— uh, it'll be in the next bulletins coming up as well, so you'll be able to see that information. Now it's your turn. There's announcements. Good morning, once again. I'm Barb McCarwich. I'll be your liturgist this morning. Before I forget, let's start this off with happy birthday, Jean and Lynn Helzerman. I can still be a part of the family, I remembered. And now that they're 21, you can buy them a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we'll ask for their IDs. Um, we've got some announcements. Boy, do we have some announcements. Um, the upper room for March and April, those books are available, so they can be picked up. The Bible study on Tuesday at 10, we are going to be doing John, the three books of John. Um, food gatherers and pantry, thanks to Dave and Chris for picking up the boxes of food. And we had 30 families come and pick up the fresh produce boxes. And a number of families came and utilized food from the uh, pantry that we have set up at Bishop since we kept warning them there's snow days coming you're going to maybe need some extra foods and you won't be able to get out. Um, okay, we have a little sad note. Our little white church encountered an accident and its roof fell off and its steeple. And if anybody's handy, we have it taped together right now, but if anybody can maybe glue it or kind of get it back together, we'd really appreciate it. And this Friday, if you're free, between the hours and two, between two and four, it's going to be our afternoon with the children. It's an early release day. No, it's a professional development day at Lincoln. So kids will be here. We are going to be decorating Valentine's Day cookies and having some other projects going on. But it's kind of like all hands on deck because those little cherubs just keep you running. So if you're free, we'd love to see you. Um, prayers for Sandy's brother-in-law. Son-in-law. Son Dang it, I have got a mental br Okay, Steve Drake, right? He had an issue with his heart, and he is home now. But he is still recovering, and can you, thank you. <laughs> He's still recovering. And um, let's see, Katrina Heiss. She had, well, he wasn't so little. Isaiah Jeremiah Williams arrived on January, uh, January 8th. And he came into the world at eight pounds, six ounces. 
Little teeny tiny Katrina, can you believe that? Uh, and then Rebecca Nitz, little Fred was born on January 24th. So they, they got their uh, little welcome to the world. So I think, whew, I think that's all. Thank you. Cracked phone. Okay, call to worship. Yes, we can do our call to worship now. Um, Alleluia. Christ is alive. Let all, Let all the people, people praise him. him. Let all creation sing with joy. Alleluia. And now we can join together as we sing our praise songs this morning. Awesome God. And then our second one is beautiful one. No. And if any of you are able, let's stand together on our first song, which is Awesome God. We'll sing this, this uh, twice. This is number 29 in your red folder, Awesome God. And then we will proceed with number 68, Beautiful One, as written. We'll start with Awesome God. to number 68, Beautiful One.
Could you join with me in reading our opening prayer? Surprising God, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you make all things new. Long ago, you called your church to a love beyond all social and cultural differences and gave them the gift of your Holy Spirit to open their hearts to enact such love. Give us that same spirit of openness that we too might discern new directions in our day for your dream to reconcile and heal all creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now if you'll join me in reading the affirmation of faith. We believe in the love kingdom of God through Christ upon us, within us, beyond us. We believe the love kingdom is like a mustard seed sown in apparent insignificance, growing into magnificence for the greening of the world. We believe the love kingdom is like yeast, inserted in humble insignificance into the dough of life, expanding into enough bread for the world. We believe the love kingdom of God is like a treasure lost and rendered insignificant under the ground, now found with joy and thanksgiving. We believe the love kingdom of God is like pearls. All others become insignificant when the largest, most beautiful pearl of all is found. We believe the love kingdom of God is like a net full of fish where even insignificant sardines are saved but worm-ridden snackfish are thrown away. We believe in the love kingdom of God through Christ upon us, within us, beyond us, where the meek and the poor, the merciful and the hungry rejoice with the angels of God. Loving God, we believe, scatter our unbelief. Amen. We will continue with uh, our current offering uh, practices where we invite you to, if you'd like, to give an offering or a tithe or gift uh, to do so in the white church in uh, the narthex. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Let us with gladness offer to God the gifts of our labor, life, and love.
Please rise as you are able and join me in our doxology. Loving God, we give you thanks for the ministry of reconciliation to which you call us in the name of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Accept these gifts for your mission to heal all creation. May they be a testament to your love for us as we share them in love for you. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And if you would remain standing as you are able for our next hymn number 154, all hail the power of Jesus' name. may be seated. It is now time for our youth moment. If our youth and children would, excuse me, come on up here and join me. And remember, you are all children of God, so technically you all can come up. Oh, I won't talk about Bruno. Don't worry, I won't talk about Bruno. Hold on. Don't talk about no, we don't talk about Bruno. Yes, we do, actually. We don't. We don't. We don't. I'm 
waiting to see if we've got our, our two other friends are coming up. Okay, okay. Hi. How are you guys all doing today? Good? So, what month is it? Who knows? February, that's right. That's right. Do you guys know what one of the, the big holidays in February is? What? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, that's right. So, when you think about Valentine's, what do you think about? We love people. We love people. Yeah, we sometimes give them Valentine's cards or letters, oh, yeah. Candy and some toys. Uh-huh. Candy. candy and toys, yeah. And happy notes. And happy notes, yeah, okay. And uh, Okay. And Whatever <laughs> your tradition might be. So, yes. Or a banana. Or a banana. Or you, a could, banana. you could do that. Or Okay, I think I think we're a little off topic now. All right. Okay. So, so we so we think about love, right? Yeah. And and we might give Valentine's cards to to people we love. So, who might we give Valentine cards to? Miss Sarah. Say it again. Your friends, okay? To Miss Sarah, okay? Who else? Okay, okay, hold on. Yes. You might give them to your teachers. Okay, yeah. So. Okay, okay. Okay, so. And, and we, we might give them those cards because we love them, right? But do we love our friends the same way we might love our mom and dad? No, it's, it's a little bit different, right? And we might, we love our teachers, but we might not love them the same way we love our grandmas and grandpas, right? So there's different kinds of love, okay? We're, that's a little bit deeper than we're going to get this morning. Um, okay, so do you guys know what this is? It is a Bible, that's right. And, and this has a lot of stories in it, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a chapter book. Um, but there's a lot of stories in here. And a lot of the stories are about God and about Jesus. And Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. That's very nice. Um. So the stories tell us a lot about how, how God loves us and, and how Jesus loves us. And do you guys remember how we know how much Jesus loves us? Do you guys remember what he did? No. I do not remember that. What do we, what do we celebrate e around Easter? Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah, the Easter Bunny Yes. Eggs. Eggs, right. Okay. So, East, yes. Okay. So, Easter, the other thing we celebrated Easter, the really important thing, is when Jesus rises from the dead. Because Jesus gave his life so that we would be saved. That's how much Jesus loves us. And the love that Jesus and God have for us has a special name. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you guys a new word, okay? Okay, the, this word is agape. What's agape? Can you guys try saying that? Agape. Agape. No, agape. Agape. Okay, agape love 
is a special kind of love that God has for us. Hold on. Okay. Agape love is a really special kind of love. It is the most purest, special kind of love that there can be. And it's the kind of love that God has for us. Okay? I, I think this group didn't have their coffee. All right. So, <clears throat> normally we would do the Lord's Prayer, but we're going to do that later when we do communion. But I want you guys, when you go to Sunday school, to listen to Miss Sarah and to have fun and always, <clears throat> excuse me, always remember to try and show not just each other, but everybody you meet good love, okay? Thanks. All right. All right, so you guys go ahead to Sunday school and have fun and learn stuff. Yes, we will send someone in for communion. All right. If you would all join me now in an attitude of prayer. In this season of love, let us offer our prayers and thanksgivings for the church and the world, saying, O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the well-being of your creation, that we may promote its ability to offer praise to you through spacious skies, bountiful seas, verdant lands, and precious creatures, great and small. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the life of the church, that our generous witness may broaden your table as all find a place to live and grow in love. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the welfare of your world, that all leaders and people, young and old, will strive to live together in harmony while serving the common good. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For all who suffer any violence, pain, or grief, that they will know the comfort of your presence as you wipe away every tear from their eyes. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For the love made known to us in Jesus Christ through this community, for this and all other blessings, we give you thanks and praise. O oh God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For all who have died, that you will bring them to the fullness of your joy where mourning and pain will be no more. O God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. For so many blessings and for answered prayers, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And then our sung response, I love you, Lord. You would please join aloud with me in our prayer for illumination. O oh God of promise, 
Your word made flesh in Jesus Christ is trustworthy and true. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may it rise up in us this day like a gift from the spring of water, life, to refresh our thirsty souls. Amen. Isn't it great we're starting to get little kids back? And thank goodness you, it's kind of an uncontrolled, it's like herding cats. Now you know why we need help this Friday between 2 and 4 when we have anywhere between 10 and 20 children here. So, because after you're going to need a stiff drink. Okay, our scripture for today, it's going to be coming from 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 through 5, and also chapter 19, 1 through 5. And continuing with my horrible week, I forgot my notes at home, but I do have one that Samuel was known as an honest and fair judge. That's all I got for you. Um, And I'm reading, it will not resemble what's in the Pew Bible because I'm taking my reading from the message, which is a more contemporary interpretation of the Bible. Chapter 18. Jonathan and David, soul friends. By the time David had finished reporting to Saul, Jonathan was deeply impressed with David. An immediate bond was forged between them he became totally committed to David. From that point on, he would be David's number one advocate and friend. Saul received David into his own household that day, no more to return to the home of his father. Jonathan, out of his deep love for David, made a covenant with him. He formalized it with solemn gifts, his own royal robe and weapons, armor, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it, and did it well. So well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody, both the people in general and Saul's servants, approved of and admired David's leadership. In our second reading from... The other reading is from Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. The Black Mood of Saul. Saul called his son Jonathan together with his servants and ordered them to kill David. But because Jonathan treasured David, he went and warned him. My father is looking for a way to kill you. Here's what you are to do. Tomorrow morning, hide and stay hidden. I'll go out with my father into the field where you are hiding. I'll talk about you with my father and we'll see what he says. Then I'll report back to you. Jonathan brought up David with his father, speaking well of him. Please, he said to his father, don't attack David. He hasn't wronged you, has he? And just look at all the good he has done. He put his life on the line when he killed the Philistine. What a great victory God gave Israel that day. You were there. You saw it and were on your feet applauding with everyone else. So why would you even think of sinning against an innocent person, killing David for no reason whatever? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now, if you could join us, I'll join together in singing Jesus Loves Me. In the hymnal, it's number 191.
You may be seated. Our next scripture readings come from 2 Samuel chapter 9, 1 through 13, and then we will jump into the New Testament in the Gospel of John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. David asked, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. The king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. The king said, is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show, kindness of, show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, son of Emil at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Emil at Lodabar. And here's one of those fun names. Meth... Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell at his, on his face and did obedience. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always." He did obedience and said, What is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But your master's grandson... Mephibosheth shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Continuing in John's gospel, the new commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you join me once again in an attitude of prayer. God of love, God who is love, we come before you in search of love. Love that heals, love that comforts, love that builds up, love that breaks down walls, love that makes us whole. We know that you offer us that love, but we also search for it amongst ourselves. We struggle to love sometimes, both others and ourselves. Help us to love as Jesus loves, fully, authentically, inclusively, and completely. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Happy February. Happy Black History Month. February is also American Heart Month, National Weddings Month, and National Grapefruit Month. Bet you didn't know about that last one, did you? 
February is also Canned Food Month, Great American Pie Month, National Bird Feeding Month, National Cherry Month, National Children's Dental Health Month, National Self-Check Month, National Hot Breakfast Month, National Library Lovers Month, National Snack Food Month, I'm on board with that one, and National Embroidery Month. Everybody got all that? And today, February 6th, has a few special designations as well beyond a very special couple's birthday. Today is National Chopstick Day, National Frozen Yogurt Day. Go ahead, celebrate those two together, I dare you. National Pork Rind Appreciation Day, Pay a Compliment Day, and several, several others. I kind of think we should have a contest to see who can celebrate the most of these in a single act, like eating pork rind ice cream with chopsticks while embroidering a great American pie design. Or maybe not, but despite all of these special designations, I think a vast majority of people think of February as the month of love as we tend to celebrate Valentine's Day on the 14th of this month. Now, I know that there have been a lot of back and forth about Valentine's Day, including its history, its commercialization as what some people call a hallmark holiday, and so on. But I don't want to get into all of that. I just want to focus on, on love. So as we sled or ski or toboggan into the second month of this year, we're going to be following a new sermon series I've written titled All About Love. Over the next four weeks, as we head towards Lent, beginning in March, we're going to be talking about love. And we'll look at what love is, what love is not, what love does and does not do, and then finally, we, finally, we'll be talking about loving the church. Now, all of this focus will come through the lens of scripture, experience, reason, and tradition, <clears throat> also known as our Wesleyan quadrilateral. We will explore how we understand human love as well as God's love. And I promise this will not just be a bunch of mushy stuff like in a romantic comedy. We're going to try to take a truly objective view of love. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Theologian Thomas Merton said that love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with another. French novelist Marcel Proust wrote, Love is space and time measured by the heart. Another Frenchman, dramatist Jean Anu, said that love is, above all, the gift of oneself. Voltaire opined that love is a canvas furnished by nature and embroidered by imagination. American evangelist David Wilkerson expressed that love is not only something you feel, it is something you do. And then we have the philosopher Plato, who apparently felt, as he once wrote, that love is a serious mental disease. It sounds like Plato might have had a little trouble in the love department, maybe. So all of those quotes reflect what some of our popular culture ideals and ideas of what love is. But we know that love is not limited to secular or cultural ideas and norms. We know that love is a crucial and foundational part of our faith. So just what does the Bible say about what love is? Well, thankfully, we have a ton of information on that. And today I want to focus on our readings from 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and John's Gospel. So let's dive in first with what we find in 1 Samuel in the chapters 18 and 19. We start with Jonathan's covenant with David. 
When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. This whole exchange is, is significant in David's story because it forever changed his relationship with the royal family. Jonathan loved David and made a covenant with him, including giving him his own sword, royal clothing, and he essentially elevated him to become a part of the royal family. With all of those last parts there, I, I think we can make an argument that love is protective. Love is inclusive, love is generous, and love is equalizing. Jonathan gave David a powerful weapon to protect himself with, all out of love. Jonathan gave David royal clothing, all out of love. He, he elevated David to be a part of the royal family, again, all out of love. That love brought David into a family that was not his birth family and one that carried power and influence. And while the text here says that Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him, it's fair to say that love itself is a covenant. We see this displayed further on in chapter 19 when Jonathan speaks to Saul about not killing David and reminding him about all the good that David has done for Saul and for the people. He even puts his father Saul right on the spot when he asks him, why then will you sin against an innocent person by killing David without cause? The text tells us that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. So in a way, Jonathan was not just pleading for David's life, but also, in a way, his own. But this idea of love as a covenant goes both ways, as a covenant should. If we jump ahead to 2 Samuel chapter 9, we find David honoring the covenant with Jonathan and still loving him. David asks, Is there anyone left from the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And as we read, there in fact is still someone. There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. David said to him, Do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all of the land of your grandfather Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. Now that is love. Remember, Saul was a real jerk to David. He tried to kill him, to go to war against him, and he was a real piece of work by the end of things. And despite everything that Saul did to David, David was still able to remember and focus on his love for Jonathan and then honor and care for Jonathan's son. Those actions honor the covenant that David and Jonathan had made. Those actions highlight the love they shared for each other, the love that, as the text said, bound their souls together. The story of this conflict of families, it didn't turn into the Hatfields and McCoys. And while you can argue that there are multiple reasons for that love, has to be one of the biggest ones. <clears throat> Just in this series of events in the life of David, we find evidence that love is a covenant. We find evidence that love is, is kindness, and kindness is love in action, and it is, is, it's beautiful. We also see that love is often intentional, I don't know that I feel completely confident in saying that love is always intentional, although that is probably how I would lean. But let's keep going into John's gospel and see what we find there about what love is. 
Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you, love, if you have love for one another. So in this reading, I think we can make the argument that love is also a commandment. I mean, yes, Jesus gives the commandment to love, but I don't think it would be incorrect to say that in doing so, Jesus makes love itself a commandment. That might be challenging for some people to accept or consider, especially because we tend to think about love primarily or in some cases only in romantic terms. And being told or commanded to love in romantic terms is wrong on all kinds of levels. But of course, that is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus was not talking about romantic love, but as I talked to our children this morning, about agape love. Agape love, when used in scripture, refers to a pure, willful, and sacrificial love that is not concerned with the self and is concerned with the greatest good of another. Agape love requires faithfulness, commitment, and sacrifice without expecting anything in return. It does not come just out of emotions or feelings or familiarity or attraction. The New Testament actually refers or references agape love over 200 times, depending on the translation you're using. And I believe we can also make the argument that love is an identifier or an identifiable mark. And I say that because Jesus says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is so powerful and so important that when we have it for other people, it can be seen in us. Whether that is seen through the things that we do, the things that we say, or through some other observable methods, love for each other is reflected in us, on us, through us, around us, and more. These words, I believe, are also another example of love being inclusive. Jesus says, love one another. And doesn't offer any disqualifying characteristics or actions or anything else. Just simply love one another. So we've talked about how love is protective. Love is inclusive. Love is generous. Love is equalizing. Love is a covenant, kindness, a commandment, and an identifier or identifiable mark for us. (coughs) Excuse me. And you can absolutely make the argument that some of these things that love is applies to agape love or romantic love or platonic love and and so on. Some may apply to only one kind of love potentially or just a few. I suppose it all depends on the kind of love you're focusing on and how you understand love. I do think that all of the ways we have talked about what love is, are applicable to agape love, given what we find in Scripture. But they are not all necessarily limited to just agape love. Some, but not all. Okay, so now we have this knowledge of what love is, according to Scripture. So now what? What do we do with this? Well, I would say we go and and use that knowledge in our lives, in how we love each other. Be kind, be generous, be protective, be inclusive and equalizing, be a visible, audible, and every other way you can think of to be an identifiable mark of love in all that you do. Be intentional in doing love, in showing love, in being love. It's not always going to be easy. We've talked about that before. 
Some people or events or experiences can make it hard to love. But that doesn't mean that we don't make a true, pure, and authentic effort. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. It's pretty plain and simple. He doesn't say love one another except for the people who are, are mean or rude or disagree with you on something or think differently than you or live differently than you or, or anything else like that. Just love one another. Just as I have loved you. That's not just my challenge to you this week and really hopefully every day of your life. But it is a divine commandment, a pure and beautiful instruction from the one who has loved more fully, more authentically, more completely than anyone else. So go out and love. Amen. If you would turn to pages 15 and 16 in your hymnals as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Could somebody run and let the Sunday school room know that we're over here? Sorry. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, 
and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion. What that means is that when we get back to normal, I'll be doing all this from over there. <clears throat> and that table doesn't belong to me, to this church, or to our denomination. That table belongs to Jesus Christ and he alone. And Jesus has invited everyone to come and partake. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your ethnicity, your social or financial or uh, standings in our community. It doesn't matter your sexual orientation. It doesn't matter your mental or physical ability. All those ways that we always try and divide ourselves into those little boxes, that's not how Jesus sees us. We are seen all as equal and loved children of God. All that he asks is that when you partake in this holy sacrament is that you do it with an open heart. Now, this morning with our, our bread and our juice, um, you can receive your elements in one of two ways. You can do intinction, which is a big word that means you take your bread, you dip it in your juice, and you receive the elements together. Or you can eat the bread and then drink the juice. Both are acceptable. Neither one is better than the other. Um, whatever your preference or comfortable you know, doing, Either one's good. So, brothers and sisters, I invite you now to take your elements, the body and blood of Christ, broken and shed for you and all the world. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 547, O Church of God United.
Beloved children of the most loving God, Jesus has loved us so that we may love others. Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. May God, who has made you a new creation, give you the grace to grow in faith, hope, love, and justice. Amen. Thank you.